Thank you very much. Um, the theme that I'm focusing on is uh, why legislation isn't enough to protect human rights. I believe we need to create a culture of rights if you're going to have an effective protection of human rights. It's no accident that the key human rights documents, the Universal Declaration, the European Convention, the Refugee Convention, were all drafted in the aftermath of the Second World War. It was a time when the world had a guilty conscience and wanted to make sure the, these things never happened again. And it was a time when more than at any other time in history, people were acutely aware that rights had to apply universally, including to groups of people who were unpopular, who were excluded, who were on the fringes of society, because it was by making Jews and the other groups that he targeted that Hitler was able to deliver murder on an industrial scale. Laws which are based on these instruments have been in place since then. But my thesis is that because politicians have failed to stress that the most crucial aspect of human rights is that they are in universal, it's been possible to retreat from this understanding. And that's why it's not enough to just have lawyers. You have to have a culture of rights too. Now, I hope You'll forgive me if I use examples in this which are drawn exclusively from Britain, because that's the place I know and understand. And I was really proud to be a newly elected Member of Parliament in uh, the Labour government of 1997, when we brought the Human Rights Act, based on the European Convention, into UK law. And this meant that cases could be heard in Britain and didn't have to face the long delays of the court here in Strasbourg. 30 years previously, I had been, or 30 years ago, not 30 years before then, um, I had been the director of the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, and we had successfully taken the cases of three women, British citizens not born in Britain, um, who were not allowed to be joined in Britain by their foreign husbands. We won those cases after a long delay so that those women had a right to family life and we won them on the basis of gender discrimination. Um, we didn't actually win all the points that we wanted to make at that point, but the world has changed since then. When the Human Rights Act was introduced in Britain, ministers believed and said that it would bring about a gradual but fundamental transformation of the relationships between individuals of the state, a shift between towards a culture of rights. But in practice, it hasn't done that. The Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights described a human rights culture, I think quite well, as one where there's a widely shared sense of entitlement to human rights and of respect for the rights of others and in which all our institutional policies and practices are influenced by these ideas. So litigation is a tool to protect the rights of an individual or to groups, but it contributes, I suggest, little to a culture of human rights. That depends not just on the courts awarding remedies, but decision makers in every public service internalising the requirements of human rights. Integrating the human rights standards into their policy and decision making processes and ensuring the delivery of public services in all fields is fully informed by human rights considerations. To make this cultural change, politicians, the press, and other public leaders must champion a human rights approach. I think, actually, as one of our first speakers, Judge Amita's description of a need for a vision of the kind of leadership, is the kind of leadership that I believe is needed to create a culture of rights. It hasn't happened in Britain, despite the 15 years or so since that legislation. And 
if we look at the groups that I think are uh, necessary to lead us towards such a culture, I think it's quite easy to, to, to see why. Let's start by looking at the press and media. I'm going to cite just two of, honestly, hundreds of typical stories which you find in mass circulation, national newspapers, and I have deliberately not chosen the red top sun and so on type newspapers, but rather more respectable ones. The first um, appeared in the Daily Telegraph, uh, and the headline read, police gave Kentucky fried chicken to a burglar because of his human rights. This was a case where a suspected car thief fleeing the police was besieged on a roof for 20 hours. During the course of the standoff, the police negotiating team gave the man Kentucky Fried Chicken and cigarettes, and it was widely reported that the police did this in order to protect the man's well-being and human rights. There's no human right engaged. Uh, there is, we don't have a human right to Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, uh, nor did he need to be provided with food in these circumstances. Rather, the police were using general negotiating tactics to encourage him to come down from the roof, quite sensibly. The next headline in the Daily Mail, prisoners have the right to access hardcore pornography because of human rights. In 2001, th there were numerous media reports in almost every newspaper that the serial killer, Dennis Nielsen, was using human rights law to demand access to hardcore porn in prison. Since then, it's been widely reported on numerous occasions that human rights law gives prisoners access to hardcore pornography. And indeed, Dennis Nielsen did try to bring a case, but when he tried to claim he was entitled to pornography under human rights law, the court denied him permission even to bring the claim on the basis that there's no arguable case that his human rights had been breached and he wasn't subsequently provided access to such porn. Despite that ruling, the, uh, the myths continue. I could use up all my time describing similar examples, but it's actually worth no noticing that when newspapers win cases themselves, for example, on protection of sources or whatever, under human rights law, they very rarely mention that it's human rights legislation which has enabled them to win. They will report their triumph. They don't report it as one on the basis of a human right to free speech or whatever. Next group that we can look at is politicians who are necessary leaders of any community. They're elected to do that. And we're in a situation in my country where the governing par party have committed themselves to repeal of the Human Rights Act. The rationale was expressed by one member of the Parliamentary Human Rights Committee, obviously influenced by the media coverage that I've just been quoting. He said, there's a growing public perception that the Human Rights Act protects only the undeserving, criminals and terrorists at the expense of the law abiding. And thanks to our human rights laws, the role of Parliament as our chief lawmaking institution is being usurped by the judiciary. So when the human Home Secretary announced at Conservative Party conference last year that her party will go into the next election committed to repeal of the Human Rights Act, it wasn't a great surprise. She said, if leaving the European Convention is what it takes to fix our human rights laws, that is what we should do. Two years previously, the same very senior minister in the British government had claimed that the deportation of one migrant in the UK had been stopped on human rights ground because of his pet cat. It wasn't true, but it's again become part of the human rights mythology which have been allowed to flourish, along with the right to Kentucky Fried Chicken and hardcore porn. So with the press and leading politicians misrepresenting human rights, what hope is there for creating a culture of human rights, and why is that important? And the, reason, the first reason why it's important is because legal action can usually only take place when rights have actually been breached. 
or people feel that they have. And surely our ambition ought to be to create a society where respect for human rights is the norm. Is that easy? Not very. Is it possible? Absolutely. If, for example, you look at legislation against sex discrimination introduced in the 1970s, as we've just seen, it didn't immediately succeed, uh, as Sandra has shown. Unequal pay is still widespread in Britain and elsewhere. And yet, in Britain, no one would now publicly seek to justify the kind of legal di discrimination which was entrenched in public and private realms at the time that the law was passed, when husbands had to sign credit agreements, girls had to achieve a higher exam result than boys to pass the 11 plus. And indeed, actually, my clients some 30 years ago were denied the right to be joined by their husbands when men in the same situation would not have been. The law did play an important role in these changes, but it was important that it was unacceptable to mass public opinion to discriminate in this way. While I could imagine the present government in the UK seeking to interfere with family life in the way of the cases that I described earlier, they wouldn't debar only women from join, to being joined by their husbands. They'd be likely to try and do it to men too. And that's the change which has been uh, achieved by creating a culture of gender equality. Alternatives to legal action can be some of the most powerful remedies to human rights abuses. I've been serving on the pre-legislative scrutiny of the Human Trafficking or Modern Slavery Bill in the United Kingdom. One issue we've considered, which has huge international relevance, is the risk of abuse of domestic servants. These victims, mostly women, do not necessarily need a right to sue their employer for the abuses they face. What they do need is a right to choose to work for someone else. Giving them that right offers a remedy for the abuse, which makes all of them much less vulnerable in future. There's evidence for this because the right to change employers was changed just over a year ago. And since it was withdrawn, Kalyan, the human rights organization, has reported comparative groups of workers who are on the original visa and workers who are on the tied visa. And tied workers are twice as likely to report having been physically abused as those who were not tied, were less likely to have their own room to sleep in, often sleeping in the kitchen, were more likely to have their passport kept from them, and twice as likely to have been trafficked. Actions brought under the Human Rights Act have protected vulnerable people from abuse in care homes. But no one should be tied to a chair to prevent them wandering, ensuring that the people who work in these places think about their work not just from the viewpoint of their convenience, but from the point of view of the human rights of the residents will be a more effective protection of their rights day to day, in my view, than legislation. I think one of the biggest barriers to building a culture of rights is that people don't understand the way in which rights conflict with each other and what to do in those circumstances. For example, the right to free assembly and speech is guaranteed to the Orange Marchers in Northern Ireland. They're unionists. But that right conflict, can conflict with the right to private and family life of the Republican residents in the areas that they want to march through. And courts can be the wrong place to deal with this kind of clash. In the convention, there's a margin of appreciation, but the adversarial justice system in Britain is much better at deciding between guilt and innocence, right and wrong, than mediating between two legitimate concerns like this. We set up a parades commission to do that, but I think there's great scope for similar kinds of mediation in other fields. The focus of this conference is on the rights of youth and women, and the point is, that youth and women are less likely to start with an equality of arms, to have the money or the knowledge to bring legal cases. For example, years after the Council of Europe 
called for the mosquito device, which can only be heard by younger people, to be banned, as it emits a noise which only under-25s can hear and is very distressing to them. There are still thousands of these devices used to disperse young people from shopping centres and other areas where they gather in. We tolerate this indiscriminate device because we've demonised young people. We advantage the, old, the rights of older people to enjoy their environment over younger people's rights to play. If there were to be a formal process where there was explicit mediation between these rights, where young and old could both be heard, we might blame young people less. Britons, for example, believe that half of our crime is committed by children and young people, when in practice the figure is 12%. So rather than just litigation, let's ten, st spend some time building a culture of rights which requires us to reflect on the consequences of where rights clash and how we handle it, about making everybody have rights. And then that means giving them to people who you don't particularly like. That's the responsibility which comes to each of us for the rights we enjoy, is protecting those same rights for others. Unless you do, you increase the risk of excluding whole groups from human rights protections. And these are the groups who are least likely to be able to take action to protect their rights. It's interesting that the focus of this meeting is on women and young people. All of us have been young at some point in our lives. Half of us are women, and most of the other half have loved women at some point. And actually, these, this is the soft end of the excluded. And it's probably quite a good place to start. It's much easier to hate migrants, people with mental health challenges, and so on. Those are much easier to be excluded than women and young people. And it seems to me that one of the things we ought to do is to draw people through understanding how women and young people are excluded to make them realise that that exclusion, that denial of rights to groups like burglars or prisoners is actually part of the same um, continuum, if you like. And if we can do that, we might begin to create a culture of human rights which can do more than legislation alone. Thank you.